Welcome to Square Notes, the Sacred Music Podcast. Your chance to learn about the teachings of the Catholic Church on sacred music, both in theory and practice, through interviews, discussions, and music. Your hearts and minds will be lifted up and better understand what it means to sing the praise of His glory. And now, your host, Dr. Jennifer Donaldson Novitska. Hello, listeners, and welcome to Square Notes, the Sacred Music Podcast. Our topic today is the music of the California Missions, and my guest is Dr. Craig Russell, a professor in the Department of Music at California Polytechnic State University in San Luis Obispo. We discuss the training of the missionaries in music and how they use music as a means of communication and evangelization. This topic of sacred music and catechesis and evangelization is one we cover extensively in the Principles of Sacred Music course, which begins May 31st, 2022, and runs through August 2nd. You'll work at your own pace for each of nine weeks, and then we'll meet August 1st and 2nd, either online or in person from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. to discuss the remaining topics of the course, which focus on the mid-20th century to the current times, with a special emphasis on practical issues in running a sacred music program. To learn more about this or any of the other courses we're offering this summer, please visit www.dunwoody.edu, D-U-N-W-O-O-D-I-E, and click on Dunwoody Music. And now, on to our interview. Thank you so much for being here with me today, Craig. Thanks. I'm glad to be here. I I always love talking about music. (laughs) So in your excellent book from Oxford Press, From Sarah to Sancho, you cover the musical life of the California missions, presenting a detailed study of different genres, the ceremonial surrounding that music, and even some of your own editions of the music. In the first chapter, you mention the extensive musical training of the Franciscans establishing the missions that enabled this flourishing musical culture. And of course, for the Catholic reader or listener, one might be reminded of this quote from Vatican II Sacrosanctum Concilium, Article 119 in the chapter on sacred music that says, quote, in certain parts of the world, especially mission lands, there are people who have their own musical traditions, and these play a great part in their religious and social life. For this reason, due importance is to be attached to their music, and a suitable place is to be given to it, not only in forming their attitude toward religion, but also in adapting worship to their native genius, as indicated in Articles 39 and 40. Therefore, when missionaries are being given training in music, every effort should be made to see that they become competent in promoting the traditional musics of these peoples, both in schools and in sacred services, as far as may be practical. You know, certainly there are questions that arise about the promotion of native musics versus the cultivation of a European music style with a sort of native accent. And that is a question that needs to be addressed. But it's interesting to begin our conversation noting here the English rendering of the phrase when missionaries are being given training in music, when, not if. <laughs> and this is modulated by the phrase in Latin, quantum fieri potest, as much as possible. So it's a little different in uh, emphasis or tone in the, in, the, in the Latin. Nevertheless, musical training is envisioned by the church, even to this day, for missionaries. Could you tell us something about what is known about the training of these Franciscans? And what would someone like Father Junipero Serra have learned about music in preparation for his missionary activities? Well, Denny, your question has a lot of facets to it. Let me just go back to the 16th century, where all of the mendicant orders figured out that music was a really useful way to communicate with people who didn't share any common language, that is, verbally. But as soon as the Franciscans sang, the indigenous nations of the uh, of the Americas figured out that, oh, this is sacred, uh, it's important, there's something universal about worship and music being combined. And then the Franciscans developed a way to involve participation really early, and we could talk about that maybe in a, in a moment. But as soon as you have people actively involved as opposed to just listening, then they come back and you can you can establish some sort of relationship. So it's really important after the first day and the big pageant and the big parade and everything that somehow you involve people. Because who wants to show up just for a whole bunch of lectures? I mean, no one's going to come back if we don't understand the words and if people are just talking. So there has to be some way to put into action some meaningful relationship. And there's nothing better than music for that purpose. Right. So 
Could you take us through the four styles of music you outline in your first chapter that distinguish how these missionaries would have thought about music, the, the categories they were putting music into? Sure. The friars, as part of their materials in their backpack, you know, they had to have a series of books to show how to build a water system, how to lay the foundation for a mission in a church, how to build the women's dorm and all that, and how to put on the worship services how to make them manifest in real time and with real sound and how to teach all that music and what's needed. So the friars had in their backpacks, almost all of them, this book by Marco Inaves called the Arte o Compendio General del Canto Llano, Figurado y Organo, which translated means basically the art or general compendium of singing in plain chant, singing with accompanied chords, and singing in polyphony. And it's sort of like a freshman crash course in how to make music. And it explains all those different styles. And in addition to plain chant, a chordal accompaniment music, and polyphony, in separate books, they learned how to do um, what they called modern style. So it sounds like Corelli or Scarlatti or early Bach or Handel, things like that. So they had those four styles, plain chant, music accompanied with improvised chords, and then what I call the Peter, Paul, and Mary, or the Crosby, Stills, and Nash style, where we're singing in polyphony with counterpoint, and then a modern style that sounds almost like it could be from a Handel or a Torio or the Bach, Me, Minor, Mass, or sometimes even sort of classical, early classical music, as if it could be Haydn or Mozart. So those are the four main styles. Right. So let's get into each of these. We're going to focus first on plain chant, canto llano. And it's really interesting to those of... Yeah, yeah. canto llano. Llano. Okay. Canto llano. Okay. So it's really interesting to those of us who are chant practitioners, particularly in terms of the that time's understanding of the rhythmic flow of the chant, as well as the sources and continued composition of chant. So could you describe for us how the missionaries would have thought about rhythm in chant? This is, of course, a very contentious topic in in um, the, the current practice of chant, but also perhaps a little bit about the relationship between the chant they were trained in and Gregorian chant. They're not exactly the same thing there. Okay, well, <laughs> the answer of how do we do things rhythmically? It could either be real simple or really complicated. So the simple answer is, we don't really know. <laughs> That's the simple answer. Um, and as you have implied, if you get a bunch of music historians in a room, we'll all disagree on this. Yes. But the instruction books, they all do say that the rhythm is determined by the words. That is, you follow the text and you don't have to squeeze everything into a steady meter of duple or triple meter. Now, there is, there is a group of scholars that believe that that happened just because it's not explained doesn't mean they didn't do it. And they have some some arguments, some of them pretty persuasive, but it's going to be hard to prove or disprove any of that until we get a YouTube channel that goes back to the, <laughs> the late 1700s Indeed. and early 1800s. So you do mention in the book that there are a, writings about particular ways of rendering the chant that basically treat each note as indivisible and, and mostly equal, you know, of course, shape, shapeable within the structure of the grammar, but mostly that it flows in an even way. Yes. I mean, all the books that are explaining how to do canto llano or plain chant say that the rhythm of the words should determine the rhythm of the music. Now, there'll be some disagreement between scholars as to what that means. Like, can we expand those longer syllables a little bit or or sort of keep everything where we could tap our foot? And until we get a recording made from the time, it's going to be hard to know. But I'd say there are a few things that help us out. Uh, for instance, Father Duran, Narciso Duran, who is one of the great music educators in the mission system, he writes out several notes in a row, little square boxes, <laughs> not to be articulated each time, but to lengthen them out. So if I'm singing a pitch and I see two or three of these boxes, obviously he wants me to hold that syllable longer than if he just has one. I think it's sort of a blend of following the natural declamation of the words, but following his advice of let's give this note a little bit more, a little bit less. And I can't think of many books in Europe that do that. I think that's sort of a California way of, of showing all the choir boys how they're supposed to sing the particular song. 
I'd say one of the aspects in chat that's interesting in California is a combination of worship to our creator, to the Lord, but also a way to establish a sense of being Spanish. Because as you sort of implied in your question, there's Gregorian chant, which was standardized, of course, all across the Christian world that was answering to Rome. But because of the, the primate church of Toledo, which is sort of like number two right after Rome, it was allowed to continue its Mozarabic rite or Visigoth chant or old Roman chant. I mean, it's, there are various terms for it. Let's see, Visigoth, Old Spanish, old and or Hispanic chant. Yeah, yeah. We've, had, we've had the episodes actually on on that. So, yeah. Okay, so when the friars are singing from the prontuario, which is basically a compendium of Mozarabic right, then it's a it's a celebration of this special privilege that the Spanish were given by the Pope, and so it's yay for Spain and also hooray for the Lord. <laughs> hooray for Jesus. <laughs> so it's sort of worship and nationalism combined into one. Right. So there's a little bit of a color to that, though. And I, I'd like to, by way of getting into that topic, describe the, the differences of approaches, for example, between Florencio Ibanez, his repertory, and even the inclusion of native elements in the chant there, and then that of maybe Far, Father Nar Narciso Duran, and the method he used to kind of drastically pare down the repertory of the proper chants. Well, Ibanez... I wouldn't say that he incorporates melodic aspects from uh, indigenous California peoples, except for the inclusion of a drum. There's this peculiar reference. I'll have to look up which piece it is. But after the antiphon, before you get into this sequence, it says, make a big ruckus with the drum. And I can't think of any chance that <laughs> reference <Indeed>. instructions <laughs> to the drummer. Um, and I'm not sure exactly what that implies, like, is that just a special effect at that moment, or was the drum playing before? And as I mentioned, it'd be hard to, to know without without a recording. But apparently, there's a drum at worship, and it was included in the middle of this plain chant delivery. Let me move to the other aspect of your question. You mentioned Duran, that Duran, he is a, a, a fabulous music educator. He wasn't probably the best performer of the friars, but he did more thinking about how to teach people how to get ready for worship than probably any other friar uh, of the time. So he wrote this instruction preface to choir book CC 59 there in the Bancroft Library at Berkeley, that that book had been at the San Jose Mission for a, a long time, and then Duran moved to Santa Barbara. And he was explaining that it was frustrating trying to teach all the rules of music to all the young choir boys because they get confused by what's the difference between half steps and whole steps and how is this mode different than that mode and why are we sometimes in two and three and, and the different lines and spaces have different names for the notes. I mean, that's why we have several years of music study as music majors at the university. <laughs> and it becomes even more difficult when you're trying to get all the liturgy learned for even one day my goodness, by the time you have all the different chants needed, you know, for the mass proper and, and also, you know, singing the mass ordinary and what happens if you're going to do vespers or matins, there's just so much stuff. And so th there was this ingenious idea by Duran to simplify all that and sort of standardize it with tunes that could be easily modified or adapted to fit the needs of the day. So here are the things he did. He only used an F clef and wrote everything's in the same key. So we don't have all these different key signatures normally. We're just always in the key of F. That helps a little bit by, okay, all the lines and spaces now have the same names. He made a staff with six lines instead of five. And in so doing, he made it possible to jam into one clef, the soprano, the alto, the tenor, and the bass all on one staff. So he could be going along with his finger pointing to the notes and his whole choir could sort of follow along. And then another major thing he did is pick one introit, one alleluia, and then one communion melody that would be sung every day. It's the same melody. And he just sort of spliced in these little sections where you have some added notes or if those could be cut out so that if 
the particular text of the introit on Monday was short, there are the sections you delete. But if you needed more syllables, you could sort of insert those leaves, that is, insert those passages of notes and sing them. It's a bit like the Thanksgiving dinner table in your house. If you only have four of you, you can make the table smaller. But if you have all your cousins and aunts and uncles showing up, you can pull the table apart and insert those extra extensions. So now you've got room for 12 people. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's a great analogy too. Okay. And so, but it's the same table. So once you've learned the tune, you can just sort of adapt it by stretching or shrinking. And of course, that's a very utilitarian and useful solution because now you can take a lot of new converts who are just learning everything from scratch. I mean, a new language, a new way to worship, a new order of worship, etc. And how can I be ready for tomorrow's church service? Because it's fast upon us. Well, I just sing that same introit melody that I was just taught and sing the same <laughs> hallelujah melody. Very practical. Right. You know, and, and that seems quite different from uh, the approach taken, for example, by some of the Jesuits up in, in northern New York and, and French Canada. But in that approach, in the in the Jesuits, it seems that there was a body of repertoire that they kept exactly the same. For example, the, the Requiem Mass chants. Are there any of those chants within uh, Duran's repertory that he kept as different from this kind of formulaic melodies and sentinizing the text on them? Well... The, the texts that are standardized, interestingly, are not from the ordinary. They're, <laughs> they're from the proper, you know, the, in other words, the introit texts, they change every day. And, of course, the Alleluia, the text, well, it's, well Alleluia stays the same, but the, the scripture before that will be, will be adapted for each specific day. And the same is true of the communion. So those melodies get standardized, but the words change. But then the variety comes in other places during the Mass or during the worship day. So there are lots of different settings, for instance, of the mass ordinary, and they sort of get progressively harder that if you look at Duran's choir books, they have the same lay layout, whether it's the choir book at Santa Clara or the one at Santa Barbara or the one at Berkeley at the Bancroft Library. They all have sort of the same format. And you first get these relatively simple duet masses and that seems pretty practical because probably you've got a couple of kids that are really good and they catch on real fast. And so within a month, you're able to do a mass by having a couple of singers. All you need is two. And of course, if you have four, it's even better or 12, even better. But you can actually do a, a full mass you know, with the proper text and such if you, if you have at least two singers. Well, then after the duet masses, you have these I'll say sort of simple quartet masses where you have soprano, alto, tenor, bass, and you've got three of those as well. And then after that, you can start doing masses in the modern style where you've got instruments and in more complex lines for both the instruments and the vocalists. And I mean, the sky's the limit once you've got people sticking around and practicing and rehearsing and learning the skills that are needed for the, the more difficult Mozartian or Haydn-esque sort of masses. Right. I guess I was wondering about particular mass formularies of the mass proper. Were there, were there any melodies that were retained? But I get what you're saying now that the, the diversity came through the mass ordinaries. Well, yeah, the melodies are retained. For instance, the, the introit, Gaute amus, di da 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 da, di da 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 da. That's the Gaudiamos introit. Well, that's the one right. that Duran said, Oh, I like that tune. Right. Well, it is. It's a gorgeous tune. <laughs> the church I, likes that tune too and uses it quite frequently. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so now he just basically pilfers all the texts from the other introits that he needs for the whole year. Right. But he, he reuses the same tune. Uh, an analogy I make in my book is it's sort of like the tube socks you can buy at Costco or whatever. Right. One, one size fits all. Right. Yeah. <laughs> they, they stretch or sink. There's only one size of sock. Right. <laughs> and, and that introit melody is the same. But there's a certain beauty in that, too. I, I can imagine waking up and, and hearing the introit is, oh, way to start off the day. It would be familiar and, you know, a, a comforting familiar aspect. And, uh, you know, Jenny, there's another aspect of, of that, and that is it promotes involvement from the get-go, that the Franciscans were really wonderful at involving people that they just met 
but in ways that, th- that could be, I won't even say explained. I mean, because how can you teach somebody something if we don't share a single word in common? Well, if we're doing something that is mutually rewarding and gratifying, I might show up the next day and give it a go again. Yeah, that's really and amazing. So- so those re- reusable tunes were, were a way to have the local community involved. And you can worry about the other stuff later, you know, starting to build, you know, the corral and starting to plant the wine grapes and stuff. But you right. can't do that if people aren't showing up. Right. And people will vote with their feet, you know, if they show up the first day and are either bored or insulted or whatever. They, I mean, there's no reason to come back. Right. Yeah. So let's actually get into these other types of music now that you started to chat about a little bit. The canto de organo. Could you describe that, the use of that style, especially on big feast days in the mission? And, you know, maybe a little bit about what the counterpoint was like. You know, was it extremely simplified from the European styles or how was it suited to the voices of the people at the mission? Well, it's a little bit, a tiny bit artificial of dividing California from Europe in this particular style. I mean, the books are coming straight from the standardized publications that the Franciscans are taught and are, again, they're, it's put in their backpacks, sort of like the Boy Scout handbook. And they would have they would have learned this music in seminary, presumably, from these books? Oh, yes. Ab- yeah, absolutely. That it was mandatory part of your training before you got in the field. So there's the Casa Matriz, the mother house, which is there in Mexico City. It's right at the corner of the Alameda. I, I don't know if you know Mexico City, but there's the Palacio de Bellas Artes, you know, the beautiful palace where the Ballet Folklorico does its its shows, you know, for tourists and stuff who come there. And then there's that beautiful big park, sort of like a, a small version of Central Park, right? The Alameda. And in the northwest corner of that, there's the it was the mother house where they did all the training. And so before they sent people out in the field, you're taught how to do things like, how do you deliver a calf? How do you make sure you have a, a, a clean drinking system? How do you uh, set a broken bone? Uh, how do you lay the foundation for a dormitory? Uh, how do you, when it's time to build your sanctuary, what direction does it face and where do you put the windows? I mean, all of that sort of stuff. You have to be self-sufficient because it's a long way to Home Depot uh, or the <laughs> shopping mall to get your stuff. And so part of it is you have to be self-sufficient musically. So how are you going to show up and introduce yourself to a new population and get people involved you know, in, in, in worship? And, of course, they consider the singing of, of Mass and, and to some extent even the hours as the primary job. It was the work of God to sing the praise of our creator. So that wasn't sort of a side thing or entertainment. That was the main focus of what they, they were supposed to achieve in that day. If you compare this, these uh, pieces, for example, to like a simple motet by Victoria, you know, is it going to be much more simple than the simplest Victoria? No, I, I'd say that the Renaissance style of Victoria and Morales and Guerrero and all that, that that's not really the repertoire that they're singing with Canto de Organo. So when we're saying Canto de Organo, I'd say it's like singing a four-part hymn now. So imagine yourself in a in a Methodist church singing all those John Wesley hymns or uh, you're singing, you know, Lutheran chorales. It, it'd be much more similar to singing, yeah, you know, the Bach chorales. Right. Soprano and alto, tenor and bass. The variety, though, in Canto de Organo is, is often achieved through alternation between scale of resources. So, for instance, the Misa del Cuarto Tono, the Mass in, in uh, for, the fourth tone of the fourth mode, which is in all the drawn books, you'll have this rich sonority with uh, you know, four or even five voice parts for a phrase, and then it'll be reduced to maybe even just one voice line. I suspect probably accompanied by some chordal strums or something, and then four parts again, or five parts, and then back to one or two voices. So it, it's sort of like big and small and big and small. And and another thing that was done with this canto de organo is once everybody sort of knows the tune, you can orchestrate, if you will, the way it's going to be delivered. So let, let me give you a, a specific example to illustrate my point. There are these theological songs called gozos or praise songs they always start with para dar luz inmortal 
in order to give immortal light. And then it says, let me tell you about Mary, or let me tell you about Joseph. And then there'll be umpteen zillion stanzas. You know, there'll be, let's say, 25 or sometimes 30 stanzas of music explaining the importance of Joseph or Mary or the Christ child or whatever. Well, it would be deathly dull to sing the same four-part harmonization stanza after stanza after stanza. You know, after 12 of those, you're ready to leave. Well, if you look at those same songs in manuscripts in Barcelona, you'll see that they they arranged like there'll be just the high voices will sing stanza three and just the low voices will sing stanza four and then stanza five will be everybody and then stanza six will be singers one and seven and you know it, it'll be sort of distributed. Well, that isn't as clear in California manuscripts for a variety of reasons. One is economics. That paper is hugely precious and expensive because we have no way of manufacturing paper in California. So all that comes from Barcelona. It's a long way for that paper to come. And you may need the paper to register the baptism of your child. So that takes precedence over writing your vocal part. So if I take what I learned from the manuscripts in Barcelona and looking at the vellum, that is the leather choir books in California, I'm sure we have this combination where the friars would say, okay, Jimmy, Pablo, and Sally, you sing verse three, and then I want Fernando and Dolores to sing, you know, verse thus and such. And those could be assigned on the spot. So you've got several things happening simultaneously. You have polyphony of like the, these four parts that everybody will have known now because they've rehearsed it. And if you have a newcomer who just showed up and they're not really big on the languages yet, their Spanish isn't so hot and they don't know Latin, well, all they got to do is survive one stanza and you can assign them one stanza. And it's sort of like putting them in the ball game. They get to carry the ball once or twice. Well, yeah. they're going to come, they're going to come back again. So you have, again, group involvement, you have polyphony that has lots of repetition because it's stanza after stanza. But you have variety because you're always changing who's singing. And it's a way to get people involved really early, quickly in the process. And again, people will vote with their feet if they feel like they're a valuable participant in an act of life in a community. It's easier to stick around than if you're ignored or you're you're given a task that's just impossible to accomplish because it's just too complicated. Right. That's a really great way of, of explaining the the bigger picture, you know, and um, I'm wondering if we could move to uh, the next kind of music, Canto Figurado, and sure. describe some of the key elements of the style there. Well, Canto Figurado <laughs> is close to my heart because that's what I played growing up in a rock band, right? You someone, someone answer the words and the chords, one, two, three, go. <laughs> and, and we're off playing. So the the manuscripts for Canto Figurado look pretty simple. It looks very much like a you know a lead sheet you know for a a pop song you might know. Uh, although they don't use they don't usually write the chords in above. As you know, uh, it's pretty easy fiddling around a little bit to figure out. Oh well, a G would work there and a C chord would work here. If I do that, maybe a D seven is next, and it, it only takes about four or five Bob Dylan songs before you you catch on. You can play <laughs> the rest of the record uh, with just one or two so, uh, you know, times through. Could you clarify? You know what what sorts of instruments are we talking about in terms of uh, accompaniment here? That is a great question. <laughs> well, what's what's the standard pop combo? if I were in Mexico City or Madrid or Cadiz or something. And that is one of the most common combinations of instruments at the time would be guitar, which I'm going to call Baroque guitar because it had fewer strings and slightly different tuning. And harp, like Baroque guitar and harp, they were hired at every performance of a play at the Coliseo in Mexico City or in Sevilla or Madrid. So if you went to see a play by... Tirso or Lope de Vega or Calderón de la Barca or whatever, not only would we have the play, but there'd be, uh, okay, I'll say the orchestra pit. Uh, there's no pit, but you know the, the musicians, musicians you show up and accompany uh, the play in places and the intermesas that go in between. Well, 
that became so standard and popular, it's a bit like uh, the expectations I would have if I went to a wedding reception today and there's a band, well, I expect to see a drummer, a bass player, and a guitar and a vocalist. Maybe another guitar, another keyboard, but that would be sort of expected. And that combination of harp and bro guitar still lives in Mexico in the Son Jarocho and the Museo Veracruzana. It's the, the standard combo that I would hear. Well, we have lots of guitars up here in California and some harps. So I figure that that would have been a, a normal sort of uh, set of available instruments, harps and guitars. You also find references in the inventories at missions to the banduria. And banduria, they're really popular in Catalonia. They're in Barcelona where I spend my summers. You get these bands of young kids who play in, in a banduria orchestra with their little ones and bigger ones and larger ones. And they go and serenade their girlfriends, you know, uh, <laughs> underneath their balconies and all that. And so there were a lot of bandurias also in the uh, uh, inventories at the mission. So you've got to somehow get uh, chords supplied to accompany Canto Figurado. Well, if I were in Europe, I'd go into church and there'd be an organ, all right? Okay, but there are no organs at the California missions. So how do I get my chords? I think the kids just grab their instruments from playing their rock and roll and off they go. They're ready to go. So, so we've got guitars and harps and bandurias and something like bandolas accompanying, um, you know, improvising the chords that go with that. And I think that it also is true of modern style, though. I think when they're playing something that would sound like Haydn, same, same expectation. If we had an organ, we could play an organ as part of the continual grouping if we're doing a piece that's, you know, say similar to Bach or Handel or something. But we don't have an organ, so I, I figured that the guitars right. and harps played along. So what, what kind of text would have been set in that style? Well, the, the standard worship text that I would be expecting. I mean, so I've got the new music for Mass. I might have the music for Vespers. And then for parades, you know, for, for um, music outside of worship, outside the sanctuary, then you could have text in regular languages, you know, Spanish and Catalan, or who knows, maybe California indigenous languages. So what are the instruments that would accompany mass in Latin inside the the mission, you know, chapel? Well, uh, if it's Canto Figurado, I figure it's voices plus this army of chordal instruments of guitars and harps and bandoles, whatever whatever anybody has handy that they know how to play. And, uh, and of course, that makes it very useful because it's adaptable. If I go from one mission to the next, I might have a really dynamite banduria player in one mission. And in the next one, it's not that player. It's the guitar player that's really good, which is a little bit like worship today, right? I'll go to some church and they have a keyboardist playing a Korg or a Yamaha. It was terrific. And I go down the street to the next Catholic church and there's someone with a, a Les Paul or a Fender Stratocaster. <laughs> you know, it's right. Sounding terrific. So uh, a question to follow up. I'm wondering if we, we could move now into the realm of ceremonial and liturgy. And maybe we could take it uh, as an example of this, the celebration of Corpus Christi. What would Corpus Christi have looked like in a California mission? Oh, hugely important for a, for a, a whole bunch of reasons. One is the Franciscans figured out really early that if people understand communion, that is, the sacrifice of our Lord, you know, he died for us. And if that can be understood, that's really the whole story. The, I mean, all the other stuff is secondary. Like, it'd be nice to know the story, and then we could go through different parables, or we can go through, you know, Old Testament, this and that. I mean, Elijah's important. I mean, we can go through all, Isaiah's important. We can go through all sorts of things. But really, the key thing is, Jesus loves us so much that he was willing to die and he had the last supper and he says, okay, break the bread and drink the wine. And when you do this, remember me and that I love you deeply. If that can be conveyed, then that's really the whole story in just about two or three sentences. Another advantage of Corpus Christi or the, the, the celebration of Corpus Christi is that it happens in the spring, which is a good time to found a mission because then you've got the longer days, so you have longer work days, and you can be, you know, pouring foundation and then planning things. And you know, it it's hard when it gets dark early 
So why establish a mission in November when it's cold and you got to stay inside all day as opposed to uh, doing it in the spring? So Corpus Christi becomes basically a founding day for lots and lots of the missions, and it's very festive, and you're ready to do the hard work of building your mission once you founded it. Was there kind of a standard repertoire that was in these choir books for what kind of music would be sung during processions for Corpus Christi? Yeah, I, I think so. And like in my book, I go through all those things. There's the the normal chance that you would have with the Feast of Corpus Christi, but also Sarah and then his right-hand man, Palau, in their in their accounts, both of them independently describe founding day at a mission. And it's pretty much the same. First thing you do is you make a big ruckus, you know, ring every bell you got. And of course, they show up with a big bell because you can, boy, those things can be heard a long way away. Indeed. <laughs> and, and, you, and you take everybody with any gun, right? So whatever soldiers you've got, or if there's some sailors or whatever, you get all your firearms. And if you're by the water, it works even better because you've got some ships with cannons and stuff. So just make a huge racket so that anybody within earshot goes, what is going on, right? And the, <laughs> And then they show up and you have this all planned. What you do is you take, <laughs> well, <laughs> if you read the founding of Carmel, they had a, a little shed apparently that they had built to lock up with their firearms and ammunition and all the sort of stuff they needed to sort of keep safe from curious hands and all that. They opened that up and then they turned that into sort of a small sort of portable sanctuary with an altar where they could have, you know, the the essential elements that you would need for for mass, and then they got out all their their banners and paintings, things they usually would have, like a picture of of the Virgin and maybe a few others, and they they'd have the the flags of the different provinces of Spain. I mean, you basically are trying to put on the Rose Bowl parade as well as you can, right? So you've got everybody all all ready to go after you've ring the bells and you get people sort of showing up, and then they made a square. Obviously, it's all outside because there is no building yet, right? But you make you make a square, and at each corner of the square, you put a table with bread and wine so you can serve communion at it. And so then what would happen is there would be a procession with all these banners and everybody all lined up. And another important thing I, I, I need to say here, they would adorn and ornament the pathway with items from nature. So cut boughs of trees or arches or flowers or something because they learned really early that Native Americans have reverence for for Mother Nature, and if you have some sort of procession and you and you have things that are obviously intimately involved with nature, they'll understand that this is a sacred ceremony, and it's not just uh, like going to a movie. They're actually doing something that that is worship, and that resonated with you know the the indigenous peoples of California, even though. It wasn't, quote, explained. It was transparently sort of clear and obvious. Okay, so they go to the, each of the four tables. And at the four tables, then Sarah, he, he set up ahead of time that some children from the local peoples would recite sacred poems. And that was sort of established that, oh, we're sanctifying this space. Everybody here in the, in the neighborhood sees this as worship of, of God. And now that we've got everybody and these kids that have recited these poems will serve communion and everyone can see that we're doing something that's important to us in celebration of our creator. Okay, well, at those four tables, since we're outside, we could have music. So I'm convinced that the four hymns that are always grouped together in the choir books are the four hymns used for Corpus Christi, for, you know, for communion, at founding day. So there's O Sacratissimo Cuerpo de Jesus, that is O Most Blessed the Holy Body of Jesus, clearly communion. Then there's O Pan de Vida, O Bread of Life, again communion. O Rey de Corazones, O Lord of Our Hearts, and then O Que Suave, O How Gentle and Sweet You Are, Our Lord. And those four hymns are in Spanish. And of course, we can sing in Spanish, we can sing in Castilian, because we're outside. If we were inside, once we built our sanctuary, we're going to change from Castilian to Latin, because un until relatively recently, historically, Latin would have been the language of mass and worship here in California. Right. So, uh, and I could go on with each yeah. of those things, but it was just a big festive 
party uh, parade. And the main aspect would be these four tables. Oh, Jenny, I, I, you got me on a roll here. I'm getting excited. When I, when I was in Panama, uh, my friend Julio Arsomena, he invited me to stay at his house during the festival of Corpus Christi in La, Vida, in La Via de los Santos in the Asuera province. And they still do exactly what I just described. Let's move now maybe um, from the description of Corpus Christi. And you've, you've um, mentioned to us the, the genre of the gozo, but could you explain to us the alba? What was it, when was it sung and what was the musical style like? Okay, there are several terms that get used sort of overlapping interchangeably. They're not identical, but they sometimes can be the same. It's one of those those confusing overlapping terms. Uh, okay, so Alba basically is a dawn song, all right? And we see references to an Alba, and there is an Alba that was sung by an old timer. I think it was on one of these um, wax cylinders you know, way back at the at the early part of the 20th century, uh, of what an alba was, and so that's that was published. That particular alba was published in the book by Father Omen da Silva, you know, in his book Mission Musica California, and it sounds like a pretty modern song. It sounds to me like a 19th century, mid 18th century. I'm sorry, mid 1800s song. It's very pretty. But I, it sounds to me like something that probably was way after Sarah and maybe even after the mission period. I mean, after the secularization of the missions, all that. I mean, it's a little hard for me to tell. The Alba is sometimes referred to as the Alabanza, a praise song. And Alabanza could be a reference to the Te Deum, that is a, a, a song or hymn of, of Thanksgiving. And of course, that could be sung at almost any time. For instance, if I had a matin service, a matin service, it closes with a Te Deum. And there are other times where a Te Deum would be sung, like anytime you're grateful and thankful, you sing a, a Te Deum or the Alabanza. There are references, like Sarah describes once, where he's he encounters a bunch of indigenous Californians. They got together, and he and his fellow friars, they sing, you know, thank you, God. They sing the Te Deum in gratitude and he talks about how oh, it was a big smash hit everyone loved it and they they sent little likes and hearts on their iphones saying how <laughs> how, how how wonderful it was i tried to stay, straighten out sort of the tangle of material related to the te Deum and the alabanza and the alba it, it's it's sort of like a knot where the threads weave back and forth and i'm not sure if i can even remember off the top of my head where each of those strands goes but i I pretty carefully document the different sources and what's going on. Um, but the, I'd say right now in the year 2022, if I if I were to look on uh, a streaming service and see the word Alba associated with California, it'd probably be that tune that was sung by this old timer that then has been set by various arrangers, including Owen De Silva's one, one of several. Uh, and it's just a beautiful hymn tune. So I guess the, it's sort of like Amazing Grace, right? And it's not like Amazing Grace has one sole single setting. It's a, it's a it's an old recognizable tune, but but it it could be done in a variety of ways. Right. So let's talk about that just to wrap up here. What would you say to musicians interested in singing this music now, and what might they consider in terms of performing forces, skill level, accompaniments, and how can music musicians get access to your arrangements of this music or recordings of it that you'd recommend? Oh, okay. There are several things you can do. Not to give a, a shameless commercial, but you know my book. You can give a shameless commercial. Okay, okay. Well, if you go to the Oxford University Press site or actually to any place where you buy, you know, your books, you know, your local, you know, support your local book dealer. <laughs> And you look up Craig H. Russell and then my book, From Sarah to Sancho. That book has within it, oh, probably a dozen to 20 pieces with all the music printed, actually physically in the book that you would need, all the text, all the translations. So you're ready to go. But I'd say even friendlier for a choir director you know, at a church or a high school or something, 
there's an appendix which is associated with my textbook. Now it's it, it's not obvious, but if you if you open up and look at the title page of the book, and then flip it, so now you're looking at the back side of the of the title page. In very small print, there's a thing that says consult the Oxford University Press website. Here's your username and here's the password. <laughs> and if you if you go to the website and use that password, the username and password, it opens up another book that's the same size, including several hundreds of pages of performing editions that are all available there. And I also include in another part of that of that appendix photographs of the mission documents so you can see what they look like. So one of my goals in writing the book was to make the music available so it could be part of worship again. So if you have got a church or, you know, again, a high school or a college or something and you're you're interested, you can find the stuff by going right to that book and uh, and and uh, again, going to the appendix and you'll get several hundreds of pages of editions. And another thing you can do if you want is you can write me, but I'll probably just tell you what I just told you now. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Craig, and, if you want, and if you want to hear some of the music, go to Chanticleer and buy their CD Mission Road because we made a movie and we made a CD and it's all uh, available as part of that same package. Right. And those recordings are so great. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, if I I don't normally give an, a, a a commercial for a specific vendor, but if you buy it through iTunes, you get the movie as well. If you buy it through Amazon, you get only the MP3 sound files. Oh you don't right, get, okay. So you know, one of the things I've loved about your arrangements, actually, Craig, are that they fit well for men's voices. You know, a t- tight sort of harmonies and. Um, you know, I, I teach seminarians who obviously are not professional musicians and they, they adapt so well to this music. So I bet music directors out there would find something of value, particularly for those sorts of situations. No. Yeah. I, uh, well, yes, I think it works really well. It also works well with women's voices In truth. I, I'm going to go back to the, the tube socks from Costco. All those pieces are so adaptable that you can find something to fit your needs. Cause that's, that will probably replicate the same sort of situation that we would have had at any of the churches back in the late 1700s and early 1800s. You know, you may have these five really good singers, and so we'll adapt this particular piece and and get ready to go. Uh, that almost everything is adjustable and adaptable because um, it's meant to be worship and person friendly. Right. Thank you so much for uh, sharing your enthusiasm for this really <laughs> wonderful repertoire. It's it's such a great treasure, and I, I encourage our listeners to go out and check it out. Yeah, if they have any questions, just contact me. You can get me through the music department at Cal Poly, or or actually my my uh, own personal email is called missionmusicman at mac.com. Just send me an email. I'll be glad to answer. That's so great. Thank you so much, Craig. Okay. Thanks, Jenny. I hope you have a great day. Thank you. We hope you've enjoyed listening to Square Notes, the sacred music podcast with Dr. Jennifer donaldson Novitska. For more information about this episode, sacred music resources, or upcoming events, visit our website at sacredmusicpodcast.com. You can subscribe to our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube, or your favorite podcast app. If you enjoy our podcast, please write us a review on iTunes. This improves our iTunes ranking and helps others find out about the podcast. The music you heard at the beginning of this episode is Hec Dies by William Byrd, sung by the London Oratory Schola Cantorum Boys Choir, directed by Charles Cole from the CD Sacred Treasures of England. The music at the conclusion of this podcast is from the Prelude and Fugue in G Major, BWV 550 by Johann Sebastian Bach, performed by Jennifer Donaldson Novitska. We look forward to having you join us next time. And until then, may we sing the praise of his glory.